Are you ready for rapid fire? It's what I was brought here to do, so I was born ready for this. I was thinking the same thing. You were specifically here for rapid fire, so you better be ready for it. So the spring transfer portal window did open today. It'll stay open until the end of this month. It's only open for two full weeks. Marcus Freeman addressed it after Saturday's scrimmage at Notre Dame. It's called having honest conversations with your players, and that's what we got to do, and that's what our, our job as coaches are, is to have honest conversations, have relationships with our players, so there are no surprises, and so that's what we do. We, this isn't just a transfer portal discussion. This is a year-round. If you love your players and you want to see them reach their full potential, you're going to have honest conversations with them, and so I don't want it to change because there's a transfer portal window coming open. <laughs> Right. That's just what we should do if we're mentors and leaders to young people. We should have a relationship with them and we should be honest with them and they should be honest with us. So then when they make a decision, hey, I want to stay, I want to transfer like it's not a surprise. But that comes from having a relationship with them, which takes time and it takes investing in those young people. I'm wondering how, you know, much of those conversations were going on with Bryce McPherson before we heard his name today. But hearing that, Jesse, makes you feel blank hearing that makes me feel really indifferent because you know I, I feel like last year when the portal opened up around this time you know there were a couple of names that that shocked a couple of people like lorenzo styles logan diggs you know uh just to name a few that that really rattled some people i feel like but tyler you know, buckner I, I don't know if that tyler buckner your list yeah, yeah, yeah tyler buckner and so I just feel indifferent because I trust in what Marcus Freeman is saying and doing, right? Like I don't, for the people that need to stay are going to stay. The people who leave are feeling some sort of pressure to leave because they feel like they're not getting, you know, enough of an opportunity or likely they're probably feeling pressure because there's younger, you know, talent kind of, you know, up and coming and it, they, they can feel that, right? Like you can feel as a player on a roster when, you, you you know, guys are, are getting close to you or potentially going to surpass you on the depth chart. And so even if there's guys who are super talented, you know, there's probably a reason why they're leaving ultimately. And I, I think I trust Marcus Freeman, like he said, to have those conversations with people and get the the, the necessary bodies, as, as I would say, in and out. And, and honestly, kind of trim off the fat because that's ultimately what it is, in my opinion. When guys are leaving to the portal, you're just trimming off the fat for for guys that no longer really have a purpose here. Yeah, and I mean, I think you've got to be you've got to be as upfront with them if you can. There can be a fine line, I think, to walk there because of of what you're talking about. But at the same time, if you have depth in the right position and you're recruiting the right way, all this stuff plays out the way it's supposed right. to, no matter what. And I think that that's that's part of where some guys are still finding themselves. And there, and there are. A couple of, I won't say prominent names, but th there will be a couple of names, I think, that pop up here within the next few days that people are going to go, well, uh, that's that's not completely unexpected. There could be, again, we don't know for sure, but as we kind of put together our short list of you know, who might end up out there, th there are still some other names that might not necessarily be surprising, but at the same time, it's like, the kind of hype and, and talent that we thought that they were coming in here with, maybe they haven't quite lived up to it, you know, and that's kind of what you get to at this point as well. Guys have their own internal expectations about what it's supposed to look like. And if they haven't found it by year three and definitely by year four, that, that makes them say, okay, it's time to go someplace else. Were you surprised? Like, what did you think when you heard of Bryce McPherson is in the transfer portal? today what did you think of that um to be honest with you and i hope vince isn't listening but you know to kickers and, and the, the kick specialists are kind of a dime a dozen yeah they're, they're it's like <laughs> my, my my old friend reggie brooks used to say it's the kicker it's the punter He's not a football player, <laughs> you know? It's not – like, I'm not losing sleep over a punter hitting the transfer portal, right? Yeah. And they and they just had Mitch Jeter transfer in, 
I'm sure he'll handle double duty being the place kicker. And well, the, but they've also got the Eric Goins, the the 30 year old Army veteran member. Also, who came that from guy the he's in. Yep. He's so part it's of like the mix. it's not like they're lacking depth, and it's not like this was like the number one punter in the country. You know what I mean? So it's just like at the end of the day, I'm really not going to lose sleep because I think you could be worse off. Like it'd be like like if uh, like I would be more concerned if for some reason we saw you know, Jagasaw enter the transfer portal, then I would be sure. losing some sleep, right? Yeah. Like that's, the, that's what I'm talking about. Like there's guys who you're just like, okay, that makes sense. Right. Or like, ah, you know, we'll find the depth somewhere else, but yeah, I, unfortunately, like I said, I, Vince, I don't mean any disrespect by this, but kickers, <laughs> punters, they're kind of replaceable. We were saying, you know, maybe four or five years down the road, Dylan D'Addario, you know, may, enters the transfer portal at, at wherever tech and ends up finishing his career at Notre Dame. Who knows? Who knows how that'll work out? I guess is there someone who, well, I guess you probably can't give like who you who you think might transfer because then if it does happen they're like oh right. this guy knew all which is, along which is why so you I shouldn't can't. have you know now you just sent off alarm bells dk you know with your <laughs> jagasaw <laughs> reference there that's why you don't mention any specific names because i think just... i don't no reaction out of you on this but i think like last year like prince collie leaving i think you're going to see maybe another linebacker leave someone who's got a lot of talent a little impatient I don't think it's Sneed by any means, but I, I just, I just stop saying names. Just stop <laughs> saying names. Okay. Don't dig yourself a deeper hole. And I'd forgotten about Prince. See, and that's like how quickly you can forget about. That's why things. I brought it up. Like Lorenzo styles and Prince Kali were just like, you know, everyone freaked out, freaking out at the time. But, but how do you feel about it now? Does, does no Their linebackers were worse? tremendous last year. Yeah. Yep. So we spent a lot of time yesterday talking about C.J. Carr's scrimmage performance Saturday, and the quarterback position could be one to watch with the portal open. Here's what Irish quarterback coach Gino Gadouli recently said about that possibility. I just try to be as transparent as I can with everybody in the room. And I, I tell this to recruits, parents all the time. Like I, I want to treat those guys as a position coach like I'd want a position coach or a head coach to treat my son. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so that's the lens I kind of see it through. And I think those guys trust me in that fact. And, um, you know, I never got to talk about the depth chart in my room because those guys, if you, if you recruit kids with great character and see the world through a realistic lens, you don't have to tell them because they know where they stand, right? Because it's about going out there. They watch the same film. They get the grades for everybody, every practice. They know where they stand. They know what they need to work on. They know what they're better at than the other guy. And I also tell them, just like I told the group downstairs, like at the end of the day, it's not you versus him, it's you versus you. He has no effect on what you do with your reps when you're in there. So at the end of the day, it's, it's like golf, like it's them versus them. Like you got to go out there, you got to operate, you got to lead. But that guy that's that's vying for that, they all want to be the starting quarterback. But that guy that's vying for the job, he has no effect on what you do with your reps, how you prepare, and what kind of energy you bring to practice every day. So I referenced this yesterday, and then I realized, wow, we haven't played that that quote, this is a perfect time to do it with the transfer portal opening and this being a topic of conversation, especially considering Notre Dame did lose two quarterbacks to the portal last year. And they were both starters, obviously, prior to that. Drew Pine and Tyler Buckner, they lost last offseason. I think the, the thing that stood out to me, Jess, is hearing him, in a, and again, this is what I referenced yesterday, him talking about, look, we grade and we watch film after every practice these guys know where they stand. They know what their strengths yeah. are. They know what their weaknesses are, you know, compared to other guys. They know where they are in this thing. So it's not like they went out there on the practice field Saturday and had a live scrimmage and all of a sudden, yes, you know, the, you know, the other two guys, you know, were, 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 you know, like the three guys were all of a sudden aware of the other guys. They, they, they know where they are as this thing goes on. Yeah, and I think that's what makes me feel more comfortable about the quarterback room and potentially, you know, putting a foot in the door in this kind of revolving door that we've seen the last few seasons of guys kind of, excuse me, transferring in and out is what Gino talks about. All of these guys have realistic, they, they see their game through realistic lenses. And I think that helps with Gino Gadouli being, you know, at, at the lead because he gives them 
realistic feedback of like you said, you get graded out. Like that was the one thing that we did after every practice, like every scrimmage. Like we didn't do this every practice, but after every you know scrimmage or maybe live team session where like it where it counted, you know what I mean? You either got a plus. Or a, or, or a minus or like a satisfactory basically uh, and we went through every single play and then you tallied up at the end and every time the starters had more pluses than everyone else you know what I mean like it's it's just how it goes right and so when you can consistently put film out there and you can see okay this is what I'm good at this is what I'm bad at everyone knows their role you know on the depth chart what they need to get better at and so again I think that goes a long way with guys, you know, feeling comfortable and not feeling like, Hey, I need to get out of here or, you know, I'm not being graded correctly. Um, and I, I think another, uh, another part that plays into this is, you know, him mentioning these guys are smart guys. They go to the university of Notre Dame. Like they're, they're not looking through this unrealistic lens. That unfortunately wasn't the case for me. You know, I, I played at as much smaller school and guys weren't as smart and they felt like, <laughs> even though that their tape, you know, their tape would literally, you, you would watch on tape them doing bad, but they still thought they for still some thought reason that they were. Yeah. Right. And so like, that doesn't seem to be the case at Notre Dame. They, they are smart enough to realize this guy is better than me. And this is what I need to do to get better essentially. So when you hear Gadouli kind of lay it out like that, like, are you, are you nervous that one of these guys might jump in the portal at the end of this weekend? Are you, you know, more confident, less confident, that, that a guy is going to jump in? I'll put it like this. I'm confident that the people who need who who I want to stay around are going to be around. I think if someone leaves, it's someone I wouldn't be like – like it'd be basically be going back to the punter situation I just talked about. Like I wouldn't be – who I think would leave, I wouldn't lose any sleep over. Okay. But if someone that I – you know what I mean? Like – I mean, long story short, if Angeli leaves, I wouldn't be surprised. But <laughs> I was wondering if you were actually going to say a name. You were dancing around it. No, but like... I think Menchi and Carr are going to stay lone, like because they they realize that next season is their opportunity to fight it out for the starting position. Like Ryan Leonard isn't going to be around next year, and I think by that point, those two would be better than Angeli. And so those two have to look through the lens of we're getting through this season and developing, and our shot, our real shot, is next season when. Leonard and potentially Angeli are gone. Yeah, I mean, I think it's split. You know, like Joe is saying, Kenny's leaving. There's plenty of other people who think that Angeli is going to leave. Maybe they both stay. Maybe they both like I, like. Again, we've only got the 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 one true image that we've got, other than drills of the three quarterbacks in action was Saturday, and the youngest guy of all of them had the best performance of all of them. Now we need to see how that carries over into the blue gold game. You know, just just for us because again for them, they've had other scrimmages that we haven't been privy. Yeah, we don't know about consistency. Did CJ Carr yeah. just light up the world that day? You know what I mean? I wouldn't think so just based on all the intangible stuff that we talked about in detail yesterday. Just like the guy looked it was different looking than a guy who is still supposed to be a senior in high school right now, all the things that he did. So, and, and that's, that's the biggest thing is like, if this guy is that close or maybe even ahead of one of those other guys right now, does that prompt one of them to get, get out of here that much quicker? Father David says Jesse needs an IB shirt that says reckless <laughs> speculation. <laughs> it's not a bad idea. <laughs> Listen, I don't want to I don't want to hear everyone cry and moan in a week when your you know your favorite five star or four star hits the transfer portal. Like it's gonna happen. There's going to be at least one big name that you didn't expect to go into the portal. I don't know who it is. I can just get like I can problem solve around. You know, it's probably in this general area is where I would expect it to come from. So I don't I, like again, I don't know any names, but it's going to happen. And if it's going to happen, I can draw conclusions to a specific group of who I think it's going to be. 
I thought you were going to follow that with another name, but no. I'm glad that no, <laughs> I'm glad that you did. I thought you were going to like pregnant pause and then they go, oh, by the way, here's who <laughs> I think it's going to be. <laughs> USMA 87 says Vince needs a shirt that says don't listen to my absolutes. I mean, he just needs he just needs the shirt that says Vince. That's what he needs, <laughs> like from the color of money, like the Tom Cruise. That's that's what Vince needs. He just needs a shirt that says Vince. And let that hair grow and do a little something with it because his hair was perfect. All right. So Notre Dame's pass rush was impressive in Saturday's scrimmage. And rising sophomore Bubakar Traore was part of that mix. I just got to keep telling the say, just keep showing up. He just keeps show, he keeps showing up, and and that isn't against just the threes, the two. It's, it's he's showing up against the ones, and so that's what you want to see, right? And that depth, that competition, and those guys that can step up and make plays. But all three of those guys have done some really positive things, along with some others. Showing up against the threes, the twos, the ones. Scale of one to ten, how big would it be if Treori does actually emerge at Viper? Uh, this would be a 10 out of 10. I told you I went on a mini ram, ram, rant last week at telling you why I thought the Viper position was consistently weak, why I have no faith in Jordan Batello, and that, you know, but basically, uh, you know, Bobacar would be kind of my guy that I would hope to step up and eventually replace, you know, Jordan Batello, right? Because you need another strong end player opposite of RJ Oban. And it sounds like Bobakar is the guy, you know, matter if it's the threes, the twos, the ones, the fours, he just consistently shows up. And like that is as a head coach, that is something so what's the word uh, solidifying maybe to see because the moment doesn't, you know, surpass someone like Bobakar. It, it doesn't matter if he's playing against the threes. The he's just going out there and giving his best every single time. So I would love to see him step up because I just think it makes the defensive line that much stronger. I completely agree. I think Henry agrees with all of your sentiments as well. Apparently he is a big Trey Horry fan, um, but it would be huge. I, I would put this at a 10 as well, based on the issues that we've talked about this position. And in the first segment, Ryan was saying, he wouldn't be shocked, you know, if they if they went out and looked to the portal for a transfer. But he also thinks R.J. Oban could go over there. You know, someone we haven't talked a whole lot about. Josh Burnham had a pretty nice scrimmage out there off the end as well. But Traore, just because of that explosiveness and you know his ability, that that quick twitch that he has to get in the backfield, he definitely flashed even more and. We saw him at times, you know, even in a even in a game last year where it happened. So I just think that this would be huge because I think that Jordan Botello needs somebody breathing down his neck and not letting him get comfortable. You know, like when it comes to anything that happens over the course of this summer and into training camp next year, I think that if Traore can at least be number two with the bullet sometime by mid training camp i think that that would be huge for notre dame and i, I think you could really have a a really good one two punch with Botello and bubakar traori potentially next week yeah and, you know just just in the the viper you know definition itself the viper is always going to be to the weak side or the boundary of the field and, and they're going to be you know primarily your pass rusher right so I just need someone who's getting getting pressure on the quarterback because RJ Oban is going to be strong in the run game. We know that. And it's not like the, you know, the other side doesn't pass rush as well. It's just the Viper is more so known for, you know, its pass rushing abilities. And so even if Bobacar doesn't become the number one, I still like that it's going to light a fire under Botello's butt, right? Like it's it, as you see someone younger surging up the depth chart behind you, and this is what year three or four, and you still haven't completely figured it out. Like, that's not a good feeling, right? No, and so even if Bobacar doesn't get the starting position, you know, worst case scenario, it lights a, a fire under Botello, and these guys are rotating, you know, or, or sharing kind of reps throughout the game. And even if Bobacar isn't the definite number one, Notre Dame still rotates its defensive line enough that you're going to see Bobacar, you know, Bobacar in there his fair share. So I think this is great because either way we're going to see – 
you know, more Bobakar and get more out of the Viper position and hopefully push Batello to be even better at the Viper position. Correct. Correct. All right. How about Jaden Osbury at Rover? Here's some thoughts from Freeman on Osbury. Yeah, he's a guy that we've said, man, he's just done such a good job at what we've asked him to do. We got to put him at different places, see how we can get him on the field. And that's a compliment to him and what he's done. Um, it was really probably over the last two or three practices we said, okay, let's try Jaden Osbury at a couple different positions because we're not going to be able to keep him off the field. He's a talented individual, you know, and so that's what spring's about, right, is being able to move your pieces around and, and saying, okay, how do we make the pieces, um, how do we formulate the scheme around the pieces, right? It's not the, the vice versa. It's not, hey, here's our scheme. This person has to fit into it. It's, okay, let's get the best players on the field and formulate the best defense around those pieces, and uh, Osbury is, is doing a, a great job. Another guy who always seems to impress every time you get to see him out there. And, you know, again, what stands out? How do we formulate the scheme around the pieces? What do you think about that? Yeah, this is it, it, it should be music to everyone's ears. This is what we've been begging for on the offensive side of the ball. Right. And, and that's what we're hopeful Denbrock is going to bring. And what we've kind of talked about the last few weeks is it feels like Denbrock is trying out guys to figure out what, you know, what pieces work best together and how they can generate a scheme, you know, around their talented players. And so it's good to hear the same thing on the defensive side of the ball. And, and really, the thing I can relate this to the most is I was listening to Craig Council, new Cubs manager, talk about Christopher Morrell. And basically what he said is, we know Christopher, Christopher Morrell lacks defensive ability, but with his bat, you have to find a way to get him in the lineup every right. single day, whether he's playing third base, whether he's DHing whether he's second, and what are you doing with the pieces around him, right? So if Morell's playing third, who's playing in outfield? Who's playing at second base? That's how I feel about Osbury is he consistently shows up as a guy who's a dude day in and day out and proves that he has to be on the field. So as a coach, it's your job to find a way to get him in there consistently because of the talent that he brings. And so Absolutely. I, th th that's just the same way I view it and the way I can you know draw parallels between the two. No, absolutely. And that's that I mean that's a great way to look. like in baseball that's kind of the the thing, right? Like if you can hit, they'll find a place for you. Is what right. they always say, regardless of where it happens to Kyle be. Kyle Schwarber, he was a horrible outfielder, but yeah. he was in the lineup every day because he could hit a home run just bat. about yep. every at bat. College catcher that they turned into an outfielder. That's right. And it, it's the same with Osbury. I just think we're going to see a lot of this guy. I think him and Sneed, we're going to see so much more of both of them this year, but especially, you know, but again, like if you're, if you're Osbury and you're the Rover and maybe that position is subbed out for the nickel, like you still have to find, you have to find snaps for Jaden Osbury if he's performing at that level or for any guy. And I think you can probably throw a Don Schuler into that mix as well. Yes. Like they brought in Rod Hurd and we haven't really, we haven't got to see anything of Rod Hurd, but we know that he's got a lot of experience, the defensive back from Northwestern. But just like we've seen in the past with different teams, if they have three safeties who they are, you know, all very confident in their abilities, I think that you, you know, like there are going to be some times where you see more, see, you know, three safety looks and, and things like that. They're going to, they're going to find ways to get their best players on the field no matter what. So I think it's really exciting to kind of, look at and just think about some of the you know the the the, the different personnel groupings that we're going to see out there on the field this season yeah and like dk saying kva you know there's another guy that we've talked about it's it's really pretty exciting to think about like you know kind of really we saw these same couple of linebackers for year after year and now all of a sudden we're going to see a lot of different guys out there at those positions this season. Were you kind of surprised that Kaiser stuck around with kind of what you just talked about? You know what I mean? It feels like he's the last of that final kind of group of linebackers who was. I think like, that I think especially with Al Golden. Like he I think that he values that veteran presence and what what Kaiser can help bring to the unit with that veteran presence, you know, kind of, and they've talked about this before with his leadership one, but also kind of imparting the wisdom a la a JD Bertrand type guy. So 
maybe Kaiser, you know, doesn't end up necessarily, you know, being in the mix to the same extent. But I think at least going in the experience and that veteran presence that he has is some of the main reason. And and Kaiser is bulked up a little bit more so he can handle playing inside more as opposed to Rover. And that'll give him some consistency there as well. And then once Kaiser leaves, it's essentially like the mantle is going to go to a guy like Drake Bowen, who's already going to be in his third year then next year. And it, you know, the baton starts getting passed along those lines. But I think that, you know, again, like we were talking about it yesterday, how the defense is ahead of the offense right now. And Marcus Freeman outlined that after the scrimmage, a big part of that is the fact that this is year three and you've got so many guys who have been in the system now. So it's it's really only new to the freshmen who are coming in. You've got so many more guys with uh, a couple of years' experience in it. And Kaiser is the most experienced of any of them right now. SSJS, why is Ian Hap batting first <laughs> for the Cubs? Do you want to do is this really a, a place? Uh, Michael asking, is this really a place that that you want to send Jesse right now at this point? No, no, no. I, it, it, this is a good question, and I won't be long about this. Um, I text. Remember, I think I texted you at the beginning of the season that I questioned Ian Happ in the leadoff spot. But the the reason why Ian Happ is in the leadoff spot is because he's in 90th percentile of get, drawing walks. Like the, he he has a tremendous eye, and then he's in the 75th percentile right now and chase percentage so like he is he is one not chasing bad pitches and two drawing a ton of walks and so even if he's not you know the hitter that you might want him to be in a craig council lineup you know when you got bellinger suzuki morell and now bush behind him you just want guys on base and so i think ian happ consistently can get on base even if he's not getting hits good breakdown good breakdown Ray wants to know if Bone is still playing baseball. The answer is yes. He football is the first priority. So, like, if there's football practice and you know if there's a conflict, he has to be there for the football practices. But he is doing both for Notre Dame this spring. Bone is playing baseball and football. And Jason asks you if you think Kaiser is going to get drafted. Excuse me, next year if he's healthy and has a good year. Um, I think he's no better. In a no better spot personally than where Bertrand and Leofel are. Like yeah, I, I thought Brown, I thought Bertrand and Leofel actually had a step ahead of yeah. Kaiser. I think Kaiser has a harder path to get drafted. And I think he'd have to have an even better season than what Bertrand did last season. Yes. Thank you very much for the reminder to everyone, Jason. He says, kindly hit the like button if you haven't for the 240 watching. Don't think it's accurate, but it says 90 out of 240. You can get that percentage up higher than that. All right, so the content that you and Ryan tried to blow for me (laughs) before we started rapid fire tonight, there was a pro football focus NFL analyst who tweeted out a graphic the other day about draft eligible running backs who ran into loaded boxes last year. Audric Estime ran into a loaded box nearly 80% of the time last season, still averaged 6.5 yards per carry, and as Ryan mentioned, he was the uh, number two running back in all the nation in terms of times running into the box and yards per carry and and yards. Isaiah Davis of South Dakota State was number one. So ESPN's Mina Kimes reposted it saying, this is why I can't quit Estime. I know the speed measurables are an issue, but as the poet Marshawn Lynch put it, sometimes you got to run through a mother bleeper's face. (laughs) This is blank to you about Estime and his value? Uh, this is at, or this, this increases Estime's value or this kind of, you know, emphasizes some of the stuff that we've talked about for someone as, and this goes into even more of, you remember last season when I, I got so mad after the Louisville game and I broke down, you know, uh, formations and motion and stuff like that because Notre Dame right. was giving away whether or not they were going to run or pass, right? And then it, and and they ran against loaded boxes even when they shouldn't have. And what happened? Audric SMA still found a way to get yards. He had the he had like 38, 10 plus, you know, 10 plus 
38 yard runs, runs and plus yards running into the loaded box. Running into yeah. the loaded box. And I think what makes this even more impressive is you saw Audric Estime run into a loaded box and still have the speed to break away from a loaded box, right? And so not only is he running into it, he's got the speed to run into it and get away from it all at the same time. I just I don't understand why people just can't put on the tape of SMA and be like that's enough, right? Because it's not like his his combine uh, performance was so horrible that we need to second guess the tape. It, it just basically you turn on the tape and you're like, okay, the numbers, you know, they're not they're not extraordinary in, in terms of combine, but they back up what we see on tape here. Like he's still a great runner regardless of if the box is loaded, whether the other team knows a run play is happening. Like, he still got the job done. And like Mina Kimes said, you know, like Marshawn Lynch said, sometimes you just got to run it into someone's face. And that's that's going to be his role on an NFL team. He's not going to be a speed back. He's not going to be a running back who catches the ball out of the, out of the backfield. He's going to be a guy to run the ball down your throat when a team doesn't want it in the third or fourth quarter when you're that's controlling right. clock. That's and exactly everyone's right. tired. So I, I That's just why, I don't like, get especially, it. especially as a rookie, I think he can be a great, you know, just what you're talking about, a sledgehammer in the second half as you change gears and you're like, you've got a lead. And now it's just like, okay, now it's, now it's uh nut crunching time. You know, it's like yeah. estimate is just going to run it at you and he's going to want to take away your will. And that's what you love about that kind of guy. I think, I think that people, are overthinking it a little bit with Audric Estime, it seems like. Because, like we're gonna we're gonna quibble about speed a little bit. Jason asks who's faster, Estime or Lynch. Lynch has him by a couple tenths of a second, I think. Um, but you know, like I've seen Lynch, and I saw Mita Kimes say this, Chris Carson is the comparison. Like, I don't I don't, I don't really, see that. I don't I've really seen like that, that comparison. Before, and I don't it's see like that. Chris Carson's just got loaded biceps like Audric Estime. Other than that, it's like what is there that's so similar? Yeah. Yeah. Like I think like when I when I look at, at Chris Carson, I see a guy who actually looks, you know, like a lot more slow footed than Audric Estime. And as I said before, when we were talking about him last week, he's not a guy who's going to be drafted because he can catch the ball out of the backfield. But that's going to be an added benefit to anyone who does draft him. The fact that he does have such soft hands. I like this comparison of of Chubb. I would just say that Chubb has a little bit more fluid hips. I think that's that would be my – he's not quite as rigid as Audric Estime. But, again, like when do you – the Browns don't ask Chubb to catch the ball out of the backfield. He's a very sound, you know, gap runner. And that's what Audric Estime is. Like, got, like you're going to see more loaded boxes and stuff like that in the NFL. So why would you not be inclined to take a guy who already has proven success – when things aren't lined up to go his way, right? Like odds were stacked against Audric Estime in that offense a lot of the times, and he still found a way to get it done. And really for a coach that, or, or for, you know, an offense that really wanted to press or rely on the run game, like Audric Estime proved that that's what you can do. He's a nice compliment, especially on play action. Like think about if you're just hammering, hammering Audric Estime, and then you hit a play action off of him in the NFL. It's 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 just great. I agree. Completely agree. I think that he's going to make somebody really happy, whoever ends up drafting him, whether it's the third round, fourth round, whatever it happens to be. Tom Brady recently said on the Deep Cut podcast that he would pick up the phone if a team called him in the event of an injury next year to talk about playing. Now, he did say, you know, if he's an owner of the Raiders, like, what that might look like if it would work. But I'm just curious, like, what do you think this means in terms of his commitment to broadcasting NFL games next season? Because he is going to start broadcasting NFL games this year. Yeah, I think that um, <laughs> broadcasting is – I think he's more serious – like, he, he's not as serious about broadcasting as I think he thinks he is or, or what he's putting on to be ultimately. Because if you're willing to say that I would – drop everything to go be a backup potentially in the NFL. Like you're not really serious about your, your broadcasting. Like Romo gave up the whole idea of football and focused on broadcasting when he didn't want to. Right. Like he, well, I, 
He kind of didn't have a choice though, because he had a broken back the year before. Well, no, yeah, I understand that, but like he he shut it off. I don't think Tom Brady right. has completely shut it off, and so I just don't think it's fair, really, to people like Greg Olson and the rest of the broadcasting community when a guy is is you know that they're willing to make him the guy, but Tom Brady isn't willing to be treat you know to treat it like that. Essentially, as serious as ultimately everyone else wants him to. So. I don't know. I just it, it doesn't sit with me because I think that there there's more deserving people out there who would give it kind of their yeah. all and all of their attention. Really, like Greg Olson comes to mind, the guy who he's you know potentially you know most likely going to be shoving out of that number one booth on Fox this year. And oh by the way, Tom Brady is supposed to be calling the Super Bowl next February in in his first season in the booth. Fox gets the Super Bowl this year, so. Tom Brady gets gets called up by, you know, I don't know, the 49ers in November and decides to come back to play. And now instead of calling the Super Bowl, he's playing in the Super Bowl for the 49ers. It just, it just, it definitely seems to me like one foot in, one foot out kind of thing. I was actually surprised it didn't happen last year that he didn't make some kind of comeback. same because there were a ton of quarterback injuries last season. Right. Yeah. Yeah, what happens? What happens if an announcer gets injured and someone has to fill in? David David Pitty says, "Is NBC announced who's replacing Collinsworth on the Notre Dame call?" Yes, it is Dan Hicks, the longtime NBC sports announcer. Dan Hicks is going to be doing the Notre Dame play-by-play. You probably know him best if you're an Olympics watcher. Dan Hicks and Rowdy Gaines always do the swimming events for NBC at the Olympics. And uh, I imagine you will see them this summer as well. Mary DeHanna Storm, a Notre Dame alum herself. Michael Parks got his uh, got his wish. Ian Happ in the seven spot tonight. Nico Horner oh, leading moved off. Moved him down. Moved him down. Thank you very much, Fred. Appreciate it. Fred throwing us the compliment. Good, good entertaining show. Doing our best. Doing our best. We try. Fill in the blank. Rob Gronkowski was the ceremonial first pitch thrower at the Red Sox Patriots Day game Monday morning. It's blank that instead of actually throwing a pitch across the plate, he did his Gronk spike and he spiked a baseball on the pitcher's mound. It's lame. <laughs> um, it's overplayed. Um, you know, it's just, it's, he's a one man act at this point. You know, like it's, we know you can spike a ball. We've seen all the touchdowns you've caught. We've seen all the commercials you've done. We've seen, you know, all these other events that he's done where he's just spiking a ball. Like, just throw the ball out, man. Like, it's it's what you do in baseball. Like, you obviously can throw, you know, throw a ball probably 90 feet. You know, like, it's not it's well, not hard. We, we've seen you spike a million things. I know, right. Like, we need to see more. So, first thing I thought, do you think it's because – he was afraid, you know, that he might not actually be able to throw the baseball across the plate. <laughs> you know, like he was going to bounce it in front of the you plate. You and DK so just, are thinking along the same line. Like, DK was he saving himself the, the embarrassment? That's right. That's that's kind. Of, that's what came to my mind. Like, he's out there. He probably did some kind of you know warm ups and practices someplace, and he's like, I don't know where this thing's going to go. So I'm just going to do my grunk shtick. And I'm going to spike the baseball. Let me ask you this: that since we're on, you know, the ceremonial first pitch, is it fair or foul that the Cavs' starting point guard threw out the first pitch Saturday night, but then didn't play on Sunday in the final regular season game? I think you can't throw the first pitch and then not show up to play in the last final regular season game the next day. No kidding. That what, <laughs> what is that? He, he just didn't show up? No. So, so, I mean, it wasn't really his decision, right? Okay. okay. But he – So they like, sat I, him out. Like They sat him, but game. also it's like you can't bring out the guy, the starting point guard the night before for the first pitch, and then the next day where they literally play across the street, he's and not he's playing. sitting out. Like, I don't know. I just – I thought that was hilarious. Yep. Excuse me. Definitely foul. Definitely foul. You know, maybe he went out and had too many that night. Who knows? <laughs> Knew he had the day off. <laughs> had too much fun at the old guards game. All right. 
Well, I think that's going to do it for today. We had a lot of good stuff, I think, on today's show. We were loaded with content, as usual. I think Ryan definitely brought the heat, and I took us home. I I, I, I rode us off into a you nice parked the car. You were our Audric Estime. That's right. Yes. Ryan was our scat back, starting out the game, you know, darting and dashing, got, you know, got us a few easy yards early, and then you plowed the way home. And uh, I stumbled know, out of the gate. A lot of people us, were on me about took us name dropping time, though. Yep, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Put the name dropping behind and parked the car in the end. You worked it out. <laughs> Proud of you. <laughs> All right. Well, again, hit that like button before you leave. We appreciate you as always. And uh, we've got plenty more coming up the rest of the week as we get a little bit closer to Saturday's Blue Gold game. We'll have plenty of that coming up over the course of the show or the course of the week, rather, as well. So hit the like button, subscribe, rate, review, listen, of course, on your Apple podcast. We do appreciate you. And we will talk to you later on Ivy Nation Sports Talk. Enjoy those red ring games, DK.